So continuing with our discussion of the Holy Spirit, we will talk now about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, specifically how the Old Testament is revealing the Holy Spirit and his work and his ministry. Just to quickly review what we had already seen. We started out with a question, if you picked up a Bible and without any background, you were trying to understand what is this spirit or what is scripture telling us? We discovered you would find that the spirit is separate from God and yet the spirit is God. Separate from God, what I mean is expressions like God sent the Spirit, or God sent his Spirit, some kind of distinction, even as it is absolutely clear that the Spirit is fully God. And that continued then to bring us to the conclusion, essentially, of the Trinity, a person who is fully God, but a person who is distinct, we wouldn't say from God, but from the Father and the Son. That did also lead us to talk about what spirits are, just the concept of spirits, and we recognize that there are human spirits, there are angelic spirits, but now when we talk about the Holy Spirit, the concept of it goes, yes, a notion of his moral or ethical holiness, he has no sin, but quite a bit more than just that. Also a notion that he is unique. There is no one like him. He is distinct or distinct different. And that's telling us then that he is the unique spirit. The only spirit like this is the notion. He is not like another angel. He is not like a human spirit at all. He is the Holy Spirit. That brings me then, as I said, to talk about the spirit in respect to the Old Testament. What does scripture reveal to us of the spirit's work in the Old Testament? I'll start with this, just for us to appreciate the breadth of scripture's revelation about the spirit. I'm going to put a graph up for you. The graph stretches across from Genesis to Revelation. And in this graph, I just, all I did is search for spirit. And I'm tracking for you, I actually did capitalized spirit, which is the editor's view of where it's referring to the Holy Spirit, capitalized as God. And if I walk through that way, I'm going to come up with a pattern like this. Okay, I don't really intend that we do too much analyzing about the details of how this works so much as I want you to appreciate how broad this theme is, that it's constant all the way across the biblical story. It's constantly evident that the Spirit is part of God's revelation of himself. And it's not as though, here's a, a critical distinction, it is not as though the, the Holy Spirit is a theme that only appears or starts to appear in the New Testament. It stretches all the way across scripture. Obviously, just like many themes, it is going to be explained in fullness in the New Testament, but it is a constant theme stretching across all of scripture. And yet there are significant differences. Uh, let me highlight some of these. First of all, as I'm tracking the Spirit across the entire Bible, I'm going to notice, and this is actually not a, dif a difference, it's just a highlight, that the Spirit appears at so many of the key points of the biblical story. Let me show you what I mean. There are turning points in the biblical story that are especially dramatic or especially theologically emphasized. For instance... In Genesis, creation, right at the beginning, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Point being, I mean, what's more foundational, fundamental than creation? The Spirit of God is already working, present, apparent at that moment of history. Here, this is quoting from Nehemiah, but it's Nehemiah looking back on the Exodus. And the Exodus is another very significant point in Old Testament history. Thou gave thy good spirit to instruct them. Well, the spirit then is working in the Exodus. He's guiding the nation of Israel as they travel in the wilderness. This is the building of the tabernacle in Exodus. Bezalel is a man who has physical skill. He's a craftsman. But then God comments, and I have filled him with the spirit of God. Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, all manner of workmanship. Bezalel is especially capable and able to build the tabernacle because of the Spirit and that God has put in him wisdom 
to build all of this furniture. As they continue through and they travel through the land, then we have them, the record of God's guiding them. They enter the land, they take possession. And then you see this, even God's guiding them in the spirit. The spirit in thy prophets, this is not capitalized in this translation. Other translations do capitalize, and I would go with it that way. The spirit speaking through the prophets. So when God speaks to them in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and he warns them, when he tells them you must repent or you will be carried off into exile, it's the spirit that's doing this. There's an interesting pattern here when David, or when David is anointed, anticipating that he will become king. The spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. And so that David can testify, the spirit of the Lord spake by me, his word was in my tongue. Well, if I'm knowing my biblical history or my Old Testament history, we already saw creation, major event, Exodus, major event, traveling through the wilderness, building the tabernacle, major event, the prophets and their warnings, that's huge. And the David promises, the Davidic covenant is a massive turning point in the history of Israel. Well, the spirit is working very specifically filling David for this role. Isaiah points ahead into the future, and here are promises that we see. I will pour water upon them that is thirsty. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and thy blessing upon thine offspring. This is kind of a new covenant type of promise. I will put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes. You will keep my judgments and do them. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions upon your servants and the maidens in those days. I will pour out my spirit. Again, the spirit is a massive emphasis in these last passages I've just read, new covenant type of passages. And my point then, simply summarizing that, is to say you can walk through the Old Testament and the highlight moments, the big events all throughout the Old Testament, the Spirit is constantly there. I, I could do a similar kind of demonstration talking about the angel of the Lord, which is Jesus Christ. The point being that the Old Testament is not ignoring either the Messiah or the Holy Spirit. It's all the way through, throughout the entire account. Three big ideas that stand out about the Spirit, specifically in the Old Testament. And um, these will help us to appreciate some of the similarities, but also some of the differences between the Spirit or the revelation about the Spirit in the New Testament versus the Old Testament. So three ideas I'd love for you to recognize and to remember about the Spirit in the Old Testament. Number one, we see certain individuals had the empowerment of God's Spirit. I just showed you some of those passages. Bezalel is going to build the tabernacle. And so God gives his Spirit to enable Bezalel to do this. And that relates to the second point here. When they did, the Spirit was enabling them to fulfill a special task. Okay, so the concept is that certain people, we see the Spirit for the purpose that God had for them. And the distinction here goes that the Spirit was always partial, temporary, or insufficient. I don't mean that the Spirit was failing them somehow. But it's because of this point. Because God's servants were always faulty and failing. Okay, let me contrast so that we're clear what I mean by this. In the New Testament, the Spirit indwells us permanently Romans 8 is very clear. We'll talk about this later. Every believer has the Spirit. So it's not as though this is a special category of believers. If you're particularly, I don't know, um, zealous in your obedience to God, then you're one of the people who has the Spirit, and there's a special category. It's not that. Every true believer has the Spirit. So the notion of that, then in the New Testament, if you are a believer, you have the Spirit permanently. It's not as though you could do something wrong and then you lose the Spirit. There's none of that. When I go back into the Old Testament, it's not working that way. In the Old Testament, in fact, I am finding that it's possible, and it did happen, that a person would have the Spirit or the Spirit would be enabling them, filling them, temporarily. 
and later I discover that actually the Spirit has left them. That means not that they lost their salvation. It means that they were enabled for a purpose. That purpose is done. God enabled, strengthened them, blessed them, helped them to accomplish his purpose. That purpose is done, and they no longer have that special enablement. A couple of examples just to show you what I mean by this. This is the example of Saul. When Saul is called by God, the, the, not Saul in the New Testament, King Saul before David, when Saul is called of God for this task, it says the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard these tidings. And his anger was kindled greatly. That is actually a righteous anger. He's going to stand up. He's going to lead the people to do something for God. And so that's a positive thing. The Spirit of God came upon Saul, but later in 1 Samuel 16, 14, here we read that the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And that's specifically because Saul sinned against God. But notice the context, the verse before, together with that, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. And the idea of this goes, God enabled Saul for a purpose, Saul failed to fulfill God's purposes. And so God's spirit passed from enabling, blessing, strengthening Saul. It passes instead to David. And now David will fulfill this purpose. Later, you read in Psalm 51, after David has sinned, David's fearful and he prays, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. I, I think the notion of it is he remembers what happened with Saul. And he remembers Saul's failure. And he's looking at it and wondering, would this be me now? Am I like this? And it's the recognition that the presence of the Spirit, the enablement of the Spirit is a blessing, but it's a blessing that came and could be lost. A, an even more obvious example of this that's just remarkable in the life of one person, when you think of Samson, Samson is strengthened by the Spirit of the Lord to have supernatural, inhuman, just miraculous power. But then he sends, and that strength is taken away. And later, that strength returns. God enables him again. Um, I don't think these kinds of cases are intended to be anything like New Testament indwelling, because New Testament indwelling doesn't work that way. It doesn't come and go. It's not temporary like this. So we've got something happening here in the Old Testament that is really different. A filling of the Spirit that is for a specific task. It's temporary, and it's only for certain people. It's not as though every believer has it in that sense. Now, that then takes us into a a greater question, and I'm going to just develop some of this later on. I'll just put the question here, and then we can turn return to it. Were Old Testament believers indwelt by the Spirit? Were they indwelt by the Spirit the way that we experience it today? Based on what I just talked about, the answer would be no. I'm going to come back later, and we'll struggle with that question a bit more. But a further question to ask here is, so if that's true, if the Old Testament is different, in the Old Testament they're not indwelt like this, in the New Testament they are, something changed, something's different. Why? Like why the change across the Testaments? We're accustomed to the fact that the New Testament is different than the Old Testament in, in many ways. We should just recognize there are reasons it's not as though the Old Testament law just was set aside for no reason. Why is the Old Testament law changed? Or why, why is our relationship to it different than it would be for an Old Testament Jew? Because Jesus fulfilled the law. Jesus changes all of that. Why does the Old Testament spend so much time talking about the history of Israel? And I moved to the New Testament and now it's international. What happened? Jesus came. The Old Testament is focused on Israel because Jesus is coming from them. But now that the Messiah has come, the world needs to hear the news about him. Okay, so in each one of these cases, the change from Old Testament to New Testament is linked to one specific reason that stands at the center. Jesus changes it all. It all. In fact, the way that you need to think about the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, they're very different. Why are they so different? 
The cross stands in the middle. The cross changes everything. Jesus Christ changes everything. And so my question here goes, can I do something like that in respect to the Holy Spirit? Okay, Jesus is what changed the law, or at least transformed our relationship to the law. Jesus is what transformed the, the concept of a focus on Israel versus an international, more, more international focus. Jesus changes it all. Does Jesus become the key for our understanding this change? Why the Spirit in the Old Testament was so different from what we think of or what we know of in the Spirit for ourselves today. And I want to show you now then another theme or another, uh, another thread of verses that are going to talk about Jesus in respect to the Spirit or the Messiah in respect to the Spirit. Here's the thing. Jesus or the Messiah in respect to the Spirit, but I'm going to show you all from the Old Testament. And here are the passages that look like this. You may not think that there are Old Testament passages describing the Messiah's relationship to the Spirit. Here they are. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. This is the branch of David. It's clearly the Messiah. The Spirit of wisdom, understanding, the Spirit of counsel, might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. I know that those words are not capitalized. That's an editorial decision. And I would be glad for them to be capitalized, actually. Because this refers to the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is upon him. Second passage, Isaiah 42. Behold, my servant, in whom I delight, my elect, in whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him. I mean, that's explicit. God's, God is speaking. God is putting his spirit upon this person. And the servant refers to the Messiah. Isaiah 48, 16. Come you now, hear this. I have not spoken in spirit, secret. From the time that it was here, there am I. And now the Lord God and his spirit has sent me. The spirit is part of sending the Messiah. Isaiah 61, 1. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. The Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. I mean, this is again a messianic passage. And Jesus, the Messiah is claiming the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Later on, I just include this last passage. Jesus reads this passage, the exact passage. And he says to them afterwards, this day is this word fulfilled in your ears. Jesus is the fulfillment of this. Okay, so if I, if I go through the Old Testament, Isaiah particularly, but there are other themes I could trace. If I go through these passages, it's quite explicit that the Spirit is on the Messiah, or the Spirit is indwelling, empowering, enabling the Messiah. The last passage I did not include here, Micah 3.8, does a similar unpacking of that theme. Why would this be, or why would this emphasis be here, that the Spirit is on the Messiah? And we will return to this question later. It almost could seem strange. Wait, Jesus is God. Does he need the Spirit of God if he is God? Well, let me give you a couple of reasons for this. Number one, the idea is that the prophets spoke for God by the power of the Spirit. Right? So when, when Isaiah, Jeremiah, even David, when they speak for God and they're speaking under inspiration or they're speaking God's words, they're speaking God's words by the power of the Spirit. And it's the Spirit that enables them to do that. Significantly, when that points ahead to the Messiah, what it is to say is that like the prophets spoke for God, the Messiah will speak for God, but he will do it perfectly. He will do it without fault. When the Messiah speaks for God, it's complete and total. Do you remember that you noticed, we saw earlier, that Saul received the Spirit, then the Spirit left him, and David instead receives the Spirit of God? The concept of it being, for a specific task, the Spirit fills him to enable him to do that task. Okay, that idea. So, the Spirit enables him to do this task. Well, David, as king then, is empowered by God for the purpose, but David himself fails. And David himself is praying, take not your spirit from me. What if the Messiah reigns as king, Isaiah 11, one of the passages I just read. He reigns as king 
perfectly because the Spirit is upon him permanently and perfectly. And I could do the same kind of theme with the priests. I could do this with a number of other roles in the Old Testament because ultimately the meaning behind anointed, remember anointing with oil and this kind of thing, but the picture behind it, you're anointing with oil as a picture of the Spirit. And the concept then of anointing, prophets are anointed, priests are anointed, kings are anointed. The concept of anointing is that they have received the Spirit for this task. Clearly, some kings, like Saul, were anointed, but never, or at some point, no longer had the empowering of the Spirit. But it's a picture of that. And the Messiah... You know what the word Messiah means. It means the anointed one. And the picture of it then is he is the perfect prophet. He is the perfect priest. He is the perfect king. The prophets spoke for God, but sometimes they failed. They were sinners. Priests, they intervened or they were mediators for God, but they themselves had to mediate for their own sins because they too were sinners. The kings ruled for God, but they were failing because sometimes they fell. All of them fell in some way. Here at last is an anointed one prophet, priest, and king, and he will do it perfectly. And you will see the richness of that. Because he doesn't just have the spirit temporarily for particular tasks, but the spirit rests on him in fullness, totally, universally, and eternally. The spirit is on Jesus without reserve. And that's possible because Jesus is not a sinner, because Jesus is God the Spirit rests on him entirely and perfectly. Now, that takes me then to one last idea to, to tap into this concept. So what we've said is Old Testament, the Spirit is partial, temporary, for a specific task. Not even everyone has the Spirit. Messiah comes, and because he is sinless, and because he is God, the Spirit is on him perfectly. Perfect prophet, perfect priest, perfect king. The richness of this has come. So the Messiah is the source of the Spirit, the fullness of the Spirit. There's one more pattern, and it's a pattern that I can just illustrate with two different passages that talk about the Messiah as the source of blessing for others. Okay, so let me show you how these work, and then I'll develop the idea. Daniel chapter 7 talks about the Messiah. There was given to him dominion and glory and kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him. So there is his dominion and his glory. I read a little further down and I discover that the saints of the Most High take the kingdom. The saints possess the kingdom forever and ever. And it happens again in verse 22. The saints of the Most High receive the kingdom. Wait a minute. I thought the Messiah receives the kingdom. Yes. And if the Messiah receives the kingdom, why are the saints receiving the kingdom? The answer is because the saints are connected to the Messiah. The Messiah is the eternal, universal, absolute King. If you are in relationship with him, you share in that richness. Okay, so that's a pattern that we have in Daniel 7. Does it happen anywhere else? I'll keep on going. And now I'm in Isaiah 53. Here's a similar idea. The Messiah suffers. He dies. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the portion or the spoil with the strong. This can also be translated the many, the multitude, because he poured out his soul unto death and because he bare the sin of many, because he made an intercession for the transgressors. And the notion of it, the idea of it goes here. He suffered for all of them. He wins the victory. That's the concept of the portion or the spoil. The rewards are the results of his victory. He wins the victory. Here's the blessing of his victory. He has overcome, but he does not keep the victory to himself. He shares it with those who are his people. And the richness of this theme then goes, the Messiah's victory has become our victory. The Messiah's reign is now shared with those who are his. Other passages, Ephesians 4 quotes from the Psalms to say that he had victory. 
he received gifts and he gave or shared those gifts with men, with the church. And so it goes on to say our spiritual gifts are a result of Jesus' victory. Jesus won, Jesus conquered, Jesus overcame, we enjoy his victory. And that's a beautiful pattern for understanding the Messiah and what he does. He overcomes, he has victory, we enjoy the blessings of his victory. But I think that concept now is probably the conceptual foundation even for this. That because the Messiah has had victory, because the Messiah has perfectly and righteously lived out all that God intends him to live out, because the Messiah has done this righteously, now the blessing, specifically the Spirit, is ours. The Spirit in the Old Testament was partial, only for some, and only to enable for a specific task. Finally, the one, the greatest, the climax, prophet, priest, and king, he comes. And the Spirit is on him perfectly, infinitely, and permanently. And the result of that, coming into the New Testament, is that all who belong to him also now have the Spirit. No longer is the Spirit for some no longer is the Spirit something that can be lost. No longer is it only for certain believers for a certain task. It's for all of us because all of us are united with Christ. And our union with Christ means that he gives the Spirit to all. Let me show you again how I can illustrate that from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is going to connect the concept of the Spirit to the New Covenant. Okay, New Covenant, you hear that? New Covenant, New Testament, same thing. And I can walk through the Old Testament and see this passage or these passages with promises like, I will pour out water, I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, my blessing upon thine offspring. Ultimately, I, I read that as the Messiah's offspring, his children. This is the covenant, my spirit that is upon thee, the Messiah. That spirit will not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord. The blessing, the blessing that is on the Messiah, yea, verily, the spirit that is upon him is ours. Ezekiel 36, a new heart I so I will give you. He's speaking not to the Messiah, but to believers. And I will put my spirit within you so that you walk in my statutes and keep my judgments. Joel 2.28, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. I think this is to highlight that in the past, you would expect this to be on some, just a few, for a specific purpose. People like kings and prophets and priests. But here now, I discover the Spirit comes on all flesh. And the result is, every believer then, sons and daughters, old men, young men, they all prophesy. It's, it's no longer a special, unique subset thing, but all believers then have the Spirit. Upon servants, upon handmaidens in those days, I will pour out my Spirit. It's a, it's a New Testament promise. The day is coming when all of them will enjoy it. Why will they all enjoy it? Because the Messiah, who perfectly has the Spirit, brings it for them. And their union with the Messiah is the key that unlocks this blessing. All right, let me return to my earlier question then. Were Old Testament believers indwelt by the Spirit? And I, I think you already know where I'm going with this, but I'm going to give you arguments against it and arguments in favor of it. Okay, I'm going to give you arguments that say that they were indwelt and arguments that say that they weren't. So here's an argument that I hear sometimes. Well, wait, if Old Testament believers were not indwelt by the Spirit, how could they have been regenerated? How could they have been enabled to live in obedience? How could they have walked with God if they don't have the Spirit of God? Another way and another really good argument here is to point out that if there is one salvation for all of time, right? It's not two ways of salvation. In the Old Testament, you were saved by works. In the New Testament, you're saved by faith. No. One salvation. Salvation has always been by faith in the Messiah. If that's the foundation then I would expect that it's one spirit as well. Okay, both of those are good arguments. There are answers for those arguments. And the answers here, I think, would go that God could regenerate, God could enable 
even if the Spirit is not indwelling as he does for us today. In other words, you wouldn't want to argue something like, okay, there's only one way that God is allowed to do this. God can do this in other ways. And in the same way, there can be, even as our salvation is one, there can be differences in our experiences. Old Testament believers looked ahead to the cross. I look backwards. Old Testament believers, as part of their obedience, needed to obey God by following him in terms of circumcision, in terms of sacrifices, in terms of the law. And my obedience to God doesn't appear in that form, but I do other things, baptism, the Lord's Supper. There are differences here, and scripture allows for those differences to be there. That doesn't mean it's a different salvation. But here's actually the more significant reason that I hold to this idea that no, Old Testament believers were not indwelt, at least not in the way that we are. And I've got three passages that support this. Let me just show you those. Number one, John chapter 7. Jesus spoke of the Spirit, watch this, which they that believe on him would receive. The Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, two comments. He's speaking of the Spirit in the future, during the life of Jesus. Future. You will receive the Spirit. And the reason for that is not something like because they're still unbelievers or something. But the reason that they future will receive the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is not yet given. And the reason the Holy Spirit is not yet given is because of Jesus. You see again the link. The reason that we experience this blessing is because of him. He is the source. Similarly, John 16, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, it's future. He will future guide you into all truth. He will speak of himself. He will show you things to come. In all of this, it's the spirit is coming. It's future. It's still pointed ahead. And I will just comment here in respect to this right here. Uh, I'd like to observe that Jesus is the one who asks the father and sends the spirit. Later in Acts 2, uh, Peter says that Jesus is the one who has poured out what you see in here. Jesus is the reason for the spirit. Again, our link, Jesus is the source. John 14, 17, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, you know him. Now watch this. He dwells with you and he will be in you. Okay, there's the recognition that the, it's not as though the spirit is absent. The spirit is present. The spirit is with them. And it's hard even to know what's the distinction between these. All I'll just say for now is that there is evidently a distinction. There is a difference. In some way, in the Old Testament, and even during the life of the disciples, he is with them. And in some way, after Pentecost, he will be in them, indwelling them. And that distinction is there. So I have at least three passages that make this distinction on purpose to say that the presence or the indwelling of the Spirit is apparently, in these cases, an Old Testament thing is different from the New Testament. The New Testament is the indwelling. In the Old Testament, you're still waiting for that to come. And of course, just to be clear, the moment when that changes is specifically Pentecost, Jesus Christ sending the Spirit. What then is the point of indwelling? What does this mean? And my final argument for this, I'm not going to explain because I want to hold it for the future. But I'm just going to show you three verses and I want you to see that the spirit or the spirit indwelling is linked to the temple. Okay, watch this. Know you not that you are the temple of God. The spirit of God dwells in you. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? What agreement does the temple of God have with idols? You're the temple of the living God. And so because of that, I will dwell in them. I will walk in them. They shall be my people. Okay, so I have three passages that are linking this indwelling notion with the temple. And that's part of my argument as well, but I'll return to it in the future. The reason that New Testament indwelling is a new thing your expectation would be Old Testament, the Spirit indwells the temple. 
We're going to talk about this, that building the temple, the tabernacle, later Solomon's temple, and then the spirit fills the temple. And your expectation is that's the place where you see the glory of God displayed. And the turn that you come to in the New Testament is, well, the temple is going to be or already is destroyed. And as these New Testament epistles are written, the question can go, the temple's gone. Where is the presence of God now? And the answer is that the spirit in the lives of his people indwells us. We are we are the replacement for the temple. I hope all of this gives you a rich appreciation of the development across scripture, seeing the richness of this theme, the Holy Spirit very much present, very much working across the Old Testament. Yes, but there's going to come a richness to this because the Messiah has the Spirit completely and perfectly and through the Messiah then, because of our relationship with him, we have the Spirit. And the enjoyment of the Spirit that you have today is directly connected to him and to his work. Because he lived righteously, perfectly. Because he came and died for your sins. Because he rose again. The victory that he won, he shares with all of us. And there's a testimony to that, a constant reminder that's on you, that it is part of you indwelling you. Here's a reminder, the Spirit is in you. Never forget the victory of Jesus Christ that won that for you. You are indwelt because Jesus died and rose again and triumphed. And he has given you a share in his victory.